Coming up on Chasing the Natty, week 12 of the college fantasy football season is here, and that means it is officially playoff season for CFF 2024. Every lineup decision matters at this point now more than ever, so we'll be giving you guys a couple of players at each of the main positions that we are starting this week, a couple of whom we'll be sitting, and then we'll be finishing up with some of your fan-submitted start sick questions. We've got all of that and more coming right after this. This is Chasing the Natty, a college fantasy football podcast. All right, welcome in everyone. This is Jared Palmgren, host of the Chasing the Natty podcast. I hope you guys are having a wonderful ride to your work on this Wednesday morning. We are the College Fantasy Football Podcast on the Campus of Canton Podcast Network. You can find us on all of your podcast feeds and on YouTube every Monday and Wednesday morning during the season at 6 a.m. sharp. If you want to support the great work we are doing here, head on over to CampusofCanton.com and subscribe there with one of our extraordinary tiers. You'll find everything you need for your CFF, Devi, C2C, betting, college DFS, really any game that you play for college football, whether and that includes articles, rankings, projections, tools, and even more than that. You can find me in the show on Twitter. I'm at CFF underscore Jared. The show is at Chasing the Natty. And the fancy fellow across from me returning to our start sit shows is Mr. Justin Leo. Justin, how are you doing today, man? Doing good. It's always good to be back on the pod. Love chatting to CFF with you. Love uh, answering some of these questions that we get. Usually, we get uh, some 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 pretty some pretty tough questions from from your crowd. So, looking forward to it. I know it's going to be another tough week with uh, the playoffs starting up in some leagues or being right around the corner and in, in, in others. So, looking forward to this one. There's a lot of tough questions right about this time of year for a couple of reasons, right? The the people who are still making start to sit decisions at this point one usually have pretty good teams because they're you know they're in the playoffs, right? So. Your roster's pretty loaded with a bunch of really good guys for the most part, right? Two, bye weeks are just not as much of a thing at this point in the season. Obviously, there's still there's still quite a few teams out there with Week 12 buys, and then you know Memphis and Oregon being two big teams that have buys next week as well. But for the most part, right, you don't have those bye weeks to kind of help narrow down which guys you're going to go with for the most part. Um, do you feel like an extra level of stress with your start sit decisions at this point in the season, Justin, I know you only got like two leagues. And I think one of them's best ball. Might be both of them are yeah. best ball. They're, they're both best ball. Yeah. Oh. So, so you, I, don't, I really you don't worry about any of that. I, I, yeah, I haven't thought about this all year, really. It's a strange feeling. It's the first year I've, I've been in this position where I'm, I'm not sort of ever really thinking about start sits unless I'm on, you know, like a, a podcast or, or doing an article. So that, I have to say for, for the viewers out there, it is a nice feeling. Uh, but there is something to be said about the that adrenaline rush, the edge of having to choose players each week. There's something about that, uh, the standard format. It's, it's, I think I will have to go back to a league next year that has that. But yeah, for, for this year, I don't have that at all. Yeah, and I definitely imagine that it's one of those things where I think going forward, I will have just a certain number of leagues every year where I will need to make start decisions because it takes a lot of time. Like, let's be real with everybody. Like, yeah, like, I, I don't. Not that I don't understand, because again, there are people out there who are just one incredibly smart and are very gifted at being able to manage a whole bunch of things at once. But just finding the time every week, one to set waivers and then also to set start set lineups. I mean, shoot, um, we got I, shoot. I actually just realized I don't I, I didn't set my auto subs for this week. Another thing that you got to kind of keep track of yeah. at this point in the season. Um, so whoopsie daisy. Um, but even still. Like there's just a there, there's definitely a lot to keep up with, and I think the the leagues like the ones you're in, Justin, right, where it is like still kind of your standard league, but it's just full best ball format. Where you still have the waivers and everything. Yeah, definitely help you to kind of expand your portfolio without having to really add a ton of extra time commitments. Yeah, well, I mean, like I was in three leagues last year with basically sort of similar setup where you know two two were standard leagues, one was best ball. Obviously, Nate's Dynasty is a, is a best ball league. 
Uh, and even with three leagues and doing content, I mean, I was already mixing up like which league I had put a waiver in, you know, like I was forgetting to put waivers in on certain players in one league and I was losing my mind thinking like, no, no, there's no way. I, I know I put a waiver in there. <laughs> so, you know, it was just it already uh, three leagues was was a little too much for me at my, at my limit. So uh, two two seems to be the sweet spot for me. Yeah, I definitely, definitely, definitely feel that. Um, but regardless, enough enough talk about that. We got some sit starts to get to for this week. People need our information in terms of what we're going to do for this first playoff week here. Or maybe you're in a league with four teams going to the playoffs and you got one more week here. Regardless, if you got that few teams in the playoff, you're probably just at least playing for a playoff spot at this point. So basically a playoff matchup at this point, regardless. So... Before we get to all that, if you guys have not already, make sure you show us some love by leaving a like, a comment, and subscribe on the YouTube side of things. If you're on the podcast side of things, make sure you leave a five-star review. Make sure you're following us wherever you are listening to the show. Not only does that support us, but it also gives the entire game of college fantasy in general support. So we do our parts. Y'all do your parts. It's free. It's wonderful. Appreciate y'all. That being said, Justin, let's get to some of these start sits for this week again. I could go over the rules here, and I will, but for most of you guys listening out there, if you're still listening at this point in the season, you pretty much know exactly what we're looking at here. But for our starts for Week 12, again, these are players outside the top 60 to this point in the season at their respective positions in total points, which leads to a little bit of cheesiness. I know, Justin, uh, the, your, your your pick at quarterback's a little cheesy Me? This no, week. I would never. No, no. <laughs> I, I definitely would not have made the exact same pick had I gotten to the show sheet first. <laughs> well, um, exactly, yeah. When I saw the sheet wasn't filled out, I was like, okay, well, I have to take this because if I don't, Jared's definitely going to take this name. So, Well, I, w- I would say I would start here, but I guess we're teasing your guy enough here first. So we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and get <laughs> yeah. him out of the way, Justin. Who are you starting at quarterback yeah, sure. this week? Well, it's the hottest name on the wire uh, at, court, at the quarterback position over the last couple of weeks. Caden Hauser, uh, quarterback for East Carolina. Uh, you know, he sort of took over as a starter about a month ago or three or four weeks ago. And the production since really speaks for itself. I mean, you just go back to look at his last three games. Uh, and the game that they're playing this week, they're playing Tulsa. That's their opponent. Uh, so really more of the same from the last three weeks. You can Right, the similar level of caliber, uh, I would assume, to Tulsa. Nothing really stands out about Tulsa in terms of uh, anything really that needs to be avoided there. This seems like a game that could be really high scoring. Uh, it's, you know, sort of a classic uh, G5, could be a high scoring game here with, uh, well, not sure if Tulsa will hold up their end of the bargain on offense, but certainly on defense, they should be uh, providing plenty of opportunities here for ECU to score. And, yeah, I mean, Jared mentioned at the beginning, this is sort of a cheesy pick. I think everybody knows by now that Hauser's, Hauser's the guy, probably. That if, if you need help there, he's probably priority number one. But in case you don't, uh, he's a guy I definitely would look at uh, this week. No, for sure, right? He's been on, he's been on an absolute tear, uh, you know, two 260-plus yards in each of his games, five-plus touchdowns in each of his last two games. I'm a little worried that might come down a little bit this week, but also, like, East Carolina is not really relying on their running game in any way, shape, or form right now, right? I mean, Harris is their leading back, and he's barely getting like 10, 12 carries a game right now. And so I don't think, given given the success they've seen with Hauser, I don't really see that stopping anytime soon. You kind of mentioned it. Tulsa, actually average against the rush, so like, but they're, again, their weakness is very much in their secondary, so East Carolina is going to hop on that. They're going to absolutely um, tear it up after that. And then even better with Hauser, he gets Tulsa this week, and then next week he goes to North Texas. So it's like, if for some reason he's still available in your waivers, which I, I should check to see what his percentage is, I have to imagine it jumped up. It was like 12% on Sunday, but given that waivers have run this week, you have to imagine it's probably north of 30% now. But even so, double check. Yeah. Double check, especially in a six-point passing touchdown league. No point in Hauser still being left on the waiver wire. Yeah, I'm seeing 22% on fan tracks right Wait, now. That's still crazy. Four-fifths of leagues still have him available. Yeah, I do wonder if their numbers are delayed a little bit. I, you know, I'm like you. I, I figure most leagues that are active have probably, but maybe some waivers haven't even cleared yet as well. So uh, that might play a factor as well. Potentially, but um, and and I always wonder like how many, what percentage of leagues are like best ball leagues and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. you know, you yeah. see, you see guys get up into like the high. 
90 percent. it's like i know like daily and horvath are both like 90 percent plus owned at this point and they're guys that just straight up were not getting drafted in best ball leagues this year so it's like mm-hmm. yeah. anyway my quarterback for this week because justin took kind of the obvious one there in kate Hauser, i had to dig a little deeper here um but i'm gonna go with uh cj Ogbana, the quarterback out of buffalo who's been on a pretty solid run recently again obviously i don't love the 14 points versus ohio but ohio's got a def- decent defense but Against Western Michigan, 22 points there. Against Akron this past week, 28.7 points. What's even better is that Ogbana is a pretty solid dual threat quarterback. Now, nothing world breaking, right? You're not gonna you're not gonna get Devin Dampier here. You're not getting a Tyler Huff or anything like that. But you know, solidly or solidly dual threat enough to where he can cause problems against Ball State. And let's be real, anything can cause problems against Ball State. A squad of toddlers playing football would, sca- would cause problems against Ball State at this point. The matchup's what I'm playing here, right? Again, there's not a ton of great matchups that you can really grab quarterbacks off the waiver wire for at this late in the season and play it for. I think Ogbon is one of them here. And hopefully Buffalo, which has had a very solid offense recently, can tear it up one more time against the Cardinals here. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to hate on the pick. This feels very, like, of the same playbook of a lot of the, like, previous pods when, when I was making my QP selections. I, I went to the Mac multiple times, I think. Came up empty-handed, I believe, every time, right, with names like Caden Simones and Parker Navarro. But the, the line of thinking, I think, is 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 still pretty um, pretty reasonable here. And, uh, you know, I... Obviously, I don't think we should be expecting anything huge, but can he get 20 points? Oh, I mean, that's kind of my sort of threshold for, for this question. You know, absolutely, I think he can. You look at his last three games. Uh, definitely, I think he can, given Ball State's defense as well. So, um, yeah, I think it's a good pick. Again, you know, I, I stole the obvious one from you. So, yeah, obviously, I had to, had to work a little harder. So, uh, but nothing wrong with that. Uh, I, I think he can get to 25 points. If he can hit 28 versus Akron, I think Ball State should... It, my only worry is a certain running back there, LJ Henderson, going off again in this game, which is very possible. I like Henderson as well as this week. I, I could have made him my running back pick at, for starts, but I did not because I didn't want to double dip on the Bulls there. What about you, Justin? Who, what running back are you going with for this week? Yeah, well, it's sort of a forgotten name in CFF and, and college football as a whole. And that is Wyoming's Harrison Whaley. So, you know, I mean, he's a guy that people were drafting in the offseason, but then uh, sort of an injury at the beginning of the year, what didn't play any games, and then, you know, came back last week or the week before last week, had a great game, you know, over 20 carries. I believe he went over 100 yards. I know he scored like 20 CFF points. Uh, let me confirm that. Yeah. So it was, it was you know, 23 on uh, 23 points, 27 carries, 170 yards, and a score versus New Mexico. Uh, opponent this week, and then they were on by last week. So the opponent this week is Colorado State. Uh, probably better on defense than New Mexico. But, you know, uh, Harrison Whaley is, is seems like he's back now. He's healthy. He's kind of the guy we all expected to be the bell cow there. No, Wyoming has a few other guys in that rotation. Some guys have, have even stepped up in CFF this year, like Sam Scott, for example. But it seems like there's enough carries uh, to go around, and, and it seems like Whaley is kind of the guy who ascended right back up to the top of the depth chart there as soon as he came back. Um, so, you know, I, I think he's a guy you can probably, uh, you know, he might be on the wire uh, available in waivers in a lot of leagues. Probably whoever drafted him probably dropped him by now. So, and, and again, they were on by last week, right? So, so some people might not have picked him up after that big performance. So he's a guy, uh, you know, I, I think he can be sort of a dark horse here down, down the road and in, in CFF for November and, and really be a, a help for a lot of teams playoff push. No, I think I, I agree with you hundred percent. I'm a, I'm a little concerned about the matchup versus Colorado state this weekend. We kind of think of Colorado state as a, you know, kind of an easier defense. We kind of think of really all of those mountain West defenses is pretty um, yeah, true. pretty much the same, <laughs> right? But like our numbers at C2C winning edge do have uh, Colorado State as a top 40 rushing defense. So again, not, you know, it's not, you know, defensive stalwart or anything like that. But for a, Ma- for, for a Mountain West team, they are pretty solid against the run. Now, the theory of the case here, right? Like you said, Justin, is the volume, right? Does, does Whaley continue to just kind of get this massive workload here towards the end of the season? 
given what we saw against New Mexico, you have to think so. But we also have to be careful thinking that, you know, every game for Harrison Whaley is going to be, you know, close to 200 yards and a touchdown kind of deal. Considering that that matchup against New Mexico, New Mexico's defense is about as porous as, I don't know, a I can't think of a simile off the top of my head, but you get my point, right? That like New Mexico's defense is not what you should be judging anybody else's performances on, right? We 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 yeah, intentionally play people who have performed poorly when they play against New Mexico. So yeah. So my running back for this week is a sumo Matt West running back here in Way Sean Parker, running back out of Wazoo. Again, I I kid Washington State fans. But regardless, I just mentioned New Mexico's defense, and that's a whole reason why I'm going here. You guys know me. I love my volume. I love my consistent guys, but sometimes you just got to break, you got to break tendency a little bit and play some of these guys that may not get the volume that you love, but man, are they explosive. And man, does he got an incredible matchup this week. And we've seen Parker all year long when he goes up against these really poor rushing defenses. He's got the chance to rip a long one on any given play. He is explosive. I'm looking forward to seeing what he can do in the years to come. Obviously, Ben Arbuckle, not very known for, you know, workhorse backs and everything like that, but this seems like a guy that this staff loves, and he's probably going to get more work going forward. He goes against New Mexico State. Again, I mentioned they are bottom 10 in the country versus the run. Sean Parker just got done with a matchup against Utah State, a very similar caliber defense where Parker ripped off almost 150 yards and two touchdowns. I would not be shocked at all if Parker repeats those stats this week, so I'm going to play him in a couple of leagues where I really need some home run plays to go my way. Yeah, well, it's, a, I think, another good pick. Uh, you know, speaking of breaking tendencies, somebody should send a memo to uh, Mike Bobo, UJOC. I mean, this guy is just... Bubble screen, bubble screen. I'm not going to go on the rant here. We'll be talking a little bit more about that game later on in the show. But uh, yeah, you know, look, and especially with this type of question, you definitely, you're not always going to be able to pick a player who's, you know, a bell cow running back or a receiver who's just constantly getting double digit targets. So you're going to have to sort of reach in some aspects. And if you're going to do it, I think sort of the line of logic there of, well, this is a very bad run defense. We just saw them get torn up by, uh, you know, Whaley, who we were talking about earlier. And, you know, Parker, we, you know, he's not a consistent touch guy, but he has had some some pretty productive games, particularly at the beginning of the year. He was looking pretty productive and then kind of it's been up and down. But this feels like a game where it's going to be more up than down for him. So I think it's a good pick. All righty. What about your wide receiver pick here, Justin? Who you, who you going with as a down-the-line yeah. starter for? Yeah, well, we're 12? going back to the back to the Mac. And the uh, name is Javon Tracy. Miami of Ohio uh, wide receiver. So, you know, Miami of Ohio, for, for those uh, people who have been playing CFF for the last couple of years, will know that this is a program that um, for the last couple of years really has had some productive wide receivers, right? Um, I can't remember his name. It might have been Sorensen a couple of years ago. He was Jack Sorensen. Yeah, there we go. Uh, he, he was pretty good. And then, you know, last year there was Gage Larvadin, who, you know, uh, was very good at the beginning of the season, kind of got injured. And, uh, sort of fizzled out later on, but certainly a productive player when he was healthy. And, and this year, you know, sort of a similar kind of thing is happening here. Javon Tracy seems to be, you know, sort of a, certainly in the last couple of weeks has emerged as a, a go-to guy in that offense, right? 11 targets last week against Ball State. You know, he's 85 yards, six catches and a touchdown. Week prior against Central Michigan, seven targets, caught five of those for 118 yards, again, scored a touchdown. So that's that's a couple, a couple of good games in a row. Uh, and, you know, when we're talking about matchups and we just talked about sort of a defense where you want to start players, particularly if they've been struggling, you know, a defense that would uh, provide a bounce back opportunity. Kent State's another one of those right in the same vein of New Mexico, where bottom of the barrel in the FBS, arguably the worst team in the FBS. I mean, they're, they're getting steamrolled by other MAC teams. Right. So just to tell you how bad it's gotten over there, if things have gotten it's sad, you know, to say. But uh, we should take advantage of it as CF efforts, right? And so this is a good matchup for Javon Tracy, Miami of Ohio in general, right? So you know, any of those players really, you know, look at the running back, Keon Mosey, he's another one. Um, I think it's a good matchup. Miami of Ohio, of Ohio is going to score, uh, you know, so why not Tracy? I mean, 
He scored a couple times in the last couple of weeks. Seems like he's as good a bet as any to score in this game as well. So yeah, I, I think Tracy's probably uh, he's an intriguing pick, and and, and he seems he feels like a pretty pretty I don't know safe pick as well this week. No, I definitely like the volume here, although it is a little inconsistent for my taste. And again, we talked like just looking at the matchup a couple of weeks ago, where you know he was less than fifty yards, still got the touchdown, which is obviously nice. Again, that's nice to see, but. If when you look at when you look at Miami of Ohio's like target distribution, literally Tracy, Virgil, and McDonald are right there next to each other on the season. It very much has been a flavor of the week, flavor of the month kind of deal for the Red Hawks in terms of which receivers kind of getting the love. So that worries me a little bit. The other worry that I kind of have is this is one of the few games this weekend where rain might be a factor. Right now, we're looking at about a 90% chance of rain, which, you know, I've never seen a weather channel be that confident in rain for a specific game. What what are we, or I guess, I guess this is tomorrow night, so that's not nearly as far ahead as I was thinking, but Regardless, like rain will be a factor here. Winds up to 10 miles an hour, which isn't like the craziest thing in the world. So they should still be able to throw the ball, but could very well be a case where the coaches, especially facing Kent State, which is a team that's just given up on the year. Miami of Ohio says, let's just hand it off to Mosey 30 times. Get out of here. Call it a day. So that's my little worry there with Tracy. But like you said, he's been very consistent the last couple of weeks. Hopefully he continues it here against a very, very bad defense. So, all right, just to recap for everybody, our two starters at quarterback are C.J. Ogbonna, quarterback out of Buffalo, going up against Ball State. Kitten Hauser, quarterback out of East Carolina, going up against Tulsa. Our two running backs are Harrison Whaley, running back out of Wyoming, going up against Colorado State. Or we can go with Sean Parker, running back out of Wazoo, going up against New Mexico. Our two wide... Oh, I didn't do my wide receiver. Good Lord. I almost skipped right over. I was just going to say, I was wondering why you were doing the the recap. But uh, well, yeah, well, we still got one left. As part of the recap, I'll give you my wide receiver (laughs) here. Um, I'm going to go Demir Miller here. Wide receiver out of Rutgers. Going up against Maryland this weekend. Maryland secondary is falling apart so dang quickly. Um, they, They have been torched the last couple of weeks here. They're currently 94th in the country. When it comes to team performance defending the pass here, and frankly, if we just took the last couple of weeks, I bet you they would be even worse. Miller has been on fire the last couple of weeks in terms of just plain volume. 33 targets over his last two games, 16 catches over the last two games. PPR monster in the making here. We've seen this before with you know, Kirk Soraka, he was the offensive coordinator back when Minnesota was having those monster Tyler Johnson and Rashad Bateman years, right? It's coming along a little late here, but as Rutgers can't rely on Kyle Manungai in that rushing game as much right now with Kyle Manungai banged up and injured, Demir Miller is clearly who this offense is flowing through right now. Obviously, I'm concerned about some scoring opportunities here, but for PPR reasons, I'm all aboard Miller this weekend. I think he'll be awesome. Justin, I know that you were actually one of the few people that were kind of hyping up Miller during the offseason when he transferred to Rutgers. I guess you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm not going to toot my own horn here too much. I mean, I write about a lot of different players, right? That's okay. I'll toot it for you. I covered Dimir Miller in the offseason as as a guy who sort of was intriguing because he was productive at the FCS level. And then he obviously moved up to Rutgers and given the success recently of FCS wide receivers moving up, you know, that that's sort of a profile that I think as CFFers warrants our attention anytime you see something like that. And, you know, it's a good shout about the OC, uh, his history at Minnesota, right? There is sort of, um, there is a breadcrumb trail of sort of production at that position. It's not really just sort of a one-off kind of thing. And I have Dimir Miller in Nate's uh, CFF league, and I was watching that game against uh, who were they? Oh, Minnesota, of course, who were they were playing last weekend because it was on TV as well. And, and I was in the playoff game and, and really needed a good performance from Dimir Miller. And he, he definitely uh, he definitely fulfilled that. I will say with Miller, as somebody who was watching that game, all of his points in that game came in the first half. So he he finished the first half with like five receptions six targets all of the yards that he has in the two scores and then literally in the second half despite the fact that they kept pumping him with targets so like seven more targets that he had in the second half literally zero catches on seven targets 
I don't know really what happened to him. Like he, he was dropping everything, even the easiest passes. And I really did not like his body language in particular. It sort of stood out to me. He, he, you know, he missed a couple of blocks on a few plays and then he was really pouting, looking at the sidelines. And then he was, you know, he's dropping passes, looking at the sidelines. It, it was just a very bizarre sort of um, turn of events. And if he'd only sort of done the cut up of, of his second half, you would have thought that was the worst game of his career, despite the fact that he went nuclear in the first half. So it was sort of a strange thing. And I do wonder if he sort of lost a little bit of the trust of his quarterback in OC. I, you know, I, I don't, this is, I'm putting my tinfoil hat on here, but you know, just I'm going out on the limb because they went to him a lot. And then eventually just at the end, they started going to, I think his name is strong. The other wide receiver and the tight end. Cause they were just like this Miller kid. He can't catch it anymore. I don't know. They can't go to him anymore. That could have just been in that game. Hopefully it sort of corrects itself and and maybe, you know, in this this game this weekend, things sort of get back to where they were, you know, in the first half and the previous game. But I do wonder because it, it was just a very, it was a very, very bad half. I mean, I, I've not seen something like that before where players are so good first half, second half, they forget how to play football. So, you know, we'll see. And another thing I'll, we'll I mean, say you saw is, the reverse with Carson Beck against Alabama, so... Well, that happens, right? Players start off bad, and then, you know, when, when they absolutely have to turn it on, they turn it on. But rarely does it go the other way. And uh, another consideration for this game as well is just doing my own research. It seems like, or I would guess, that Kyle Manunga is going to play. Um, Shiano said he was really close last weekend, and they had to sort of protect him against himself, is, this, is the way he sort of framed it. So, uh, again, it was a concussion, I believe, from Nunga. So usually that's a one-week thing. Next week, he's back and the thing. So the, the ground game might be more of an emphasis in this one. Um, but as somebody who was a shareholder of Daimir Miller in Nate's League and, and still in the playoffs, I would absolutely love for you to be correct here, Jared. I, I hope he has another 20 targets, multiple scores. That would be fantastic. So I just also realized I've made a horrible mistake here. Um CJ Agbana is playing tonight. <laughs> so this does not help anybody me recommending him here today. So let me see if I can find a quarterback for you guys here. Um Jalen Radar gets an easy matchup against Georgia Southern, or Georgia State, so that might be a fun one for you guys. UNC, both the quarterbacks are Jacoby Criswell and Hank Bachmeyer might be fun plays in that matchup. Keon Jenkins against Jacksonville State. Jacksonville State's gonna run it up, so you know, Jenkins is going to have to play some hero ball. This is bonus content for you guys because I'm just a dummy in terms of picking out my starting quarterback for this week. Um, yeah, th those are some names I'll just kind of throw out there. My apologies to y'all for wasting your time talking about Akbana just now. I'm not on it tonight. That was my mistake, y'all. Anyway, let's talk about some of our sits for this week, Justin. Again, quick reminder to everybody, these are players that have to be within the top 40 to this point in the season for their respective positions. That way, we're not just telling you to sit nobodies. These are players that have been productive at times this year, but maybe they're on a bit of a skid, and we think the skid's going to continue, or we just think it's a really bad matchup. So, Justin, throw it over to you first, man. <laughs> Quarterback, who are you sitting this week? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, this is a, this is a guy I never really never really thought I'd, I'd be in this position where I'm, I'm recommending that people sit him. But, you know, here we are. Uh, Blake Horvath, quarterback at Navy, at one point was sort of a dark horse Heisman uh, hopeful. And now, you know, it's been sort of uh, multiple bad performances in a row. Granted, you know, there was some tougher competition there. They played Notre Dame in one of those games over the last three weeks or so. Uh, but they're playing Tulane this weekend, which Tulane typically, you know, one of the better G5 teams. And, you know, more importantly, I'm sort of just looking at the trend with, with Horvath right now and I'm not really liking what I'm seeing. Right. I mean, it, it's, it's kind of been, <laughs> you know, he had some monster performances uh, early on in the year, you know, and then it's kind of just been like a consistent downward slide with, um, with Horvath, right. The last three games, you know, Notre Dame, no passing touchdowns, one rushing touchdown, the week after he plays Rice, you know, many, including me, were thinking, okay, that's that's going to be a bounce back game. Again, zero passing touchdowns, one rushing touchdown. Uh, a little bit better this past week against uh, South Florida, where he had a passing touchdown and a rushing touchdown. But uh, in general, you know, I'd like him to channel a little bit more of his service academy colleague, Bryce Daly, call his own number a little bit more when they get in the red zone. I mean, Daly is just, he's 
vacuum up every every score, right? He always calls his own number. Horvath is a little too too good of a teammate for my liking. And then unfortunately, I mean, probably his teammates like him, but it's not great for CFF, right? And it's getting these other guys involved. And unfortunately, that's usually meaning, you know, handing it off and, and giving them the carry so he doesn't even get the passing touchdown credit. Really, that's tough. And so, you know, the trend here is not something I like. And, you know, if, if this is a critical game for you this week, which probably it is, I don't know if this is really the player I want to trust in. Uh, again, always comes down to the options that you have, but I, I just the writing seems to be on the wall with Horvath. Could he have a bounce back game? I don't know. I'm sure like it could happen at, at some point, right? But I don't know that just this is the player I want to trust in this week, despite how good he was earlier in the year. Yeah, I would not count on a bounce back performance from Horvath this week. One, just because of the matchup here. Tulane's defensive numbers are great here. They're 37th of the country defending the run, 6th in the country defending the pass, which you don't really need that much for Navy. But even so, Navy, like you said, Navy, you know, they, they do get these explosive pass plays off. And unfortunately for them, Tulane seemed pretty good at limiting explosive passes here. The other part of this is that Navy, over these last three weeks, has some kind of tougher matchups here. To give you guys an idea, right? Again, they get they get East Carolina, they get um or oh, did I say this correctly? Yes, they get Tulane, they get East Carolina, they get Army, right? Looking at my rest of season rankings, which by the way, available at campusagenton.com, just go to our campus rankings and you click on the CFF tab there. And you will see our rest of season rankings there. Unfortunately, you don't get the projections that go along with that. We're still working on getting those uploaded onto the website, but you will see the rankings there. One name you will not find, though, on those rankings is Blake Horvath. He takes quite a big hit here in projections over these last couple of weeks where he is dropping, like, to this point in the season, Blake Horvath is seventh in the, co- in the country among quarterbacks for fantasy points per game. Among these last three weeks, he drops down to 29th, right? That is a huge, huge drop from where he was looking at. So unfortunately for everybody out there, Horvath is just, I don't think, really set to have any great games here towards the end. Maybe he gets it done versus East Carolina, but against Army, that's going to be a low-scoring game between those two teams. They know how to handle the triple option teams. So, yeah. Yeah. I am full agree with you here on Horvath, and I would just say, like, if you have Horvath and you are counting on him, you need to be hitting the waiver wire this week for a quarterback option. So, um, my quarterback option, I'm throwing out here Mr. Talon Green, quarterback of Arkansas. A little cheeky here because, you know, he has been banged up. He's been kind of injured here. But according to Sam Pittman, he is expected to be good to go this weekend against Texas. Even if he's playing out there, I ain't trusting this with a 10-foot pole. Green's been very up and down the last couple of weeks, right? Against LSU, 12 points there. Against Mississippi, or Ole Miss there, less than 8 points. Against Mississippi State, 46 points. Again, obviously he did very, very well in that game against a very porous defense. Problem is, Texas, where all the people talking about, like, oh, they're frauds, oh, they played a weak schedule. Our adjusted numbers, our adjusted defensive numbers still have Texas as the number one team against the pass, and number nine team against the rush. They're still doing what they are supposed to be doing. They're holding down offenses. And unlike Justin's erroneous comment about Georgia carving up uh, Texas in that game, (laughs) Justin, we we, we had like three turnovers that put us within the 30-yard line. Um, Uh, Georgia exposed Texas for the the frauds that they are. (laughs) Anyway. Uh, you, You know it. I know it. But regardless, our numbers still have Texas as one of the toughest defenses in the country. I do not expect Arkansas to be the ones to suddenly blow this up for them. Taylor Green's not going to have one of his great weekends this weekend, especially if he's still banged up in any way, shape, or form. So if you're relying on Taylor Green, don't do it this weekend. So, Running backs, Justin. Or do you have any thoughts on that? No, no, I think you summarized it pretty pretty good. good, Now... (laughs) <laughs> Speaking of UGA bias here from Justin, uh, who are you, yeah, who are you sitting? Who are, who are you? Who are you sitting at running back here, Justin? 
Yeah, well, look, I mean, and I, I, yeah, I think your comment is in response to my comment in the show sheet, which I, I will not reveal to, to the to the to the outside audience. This is all a rigorous process, and and sort of what goes into my selections. And the 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 name I'm choosing to sit this week is Dylan Sampson, who's playing for Tennessee. Obviously, he's been on fire this year, but he's running into a, a buzzsaw this weekend in Athens. <clears throat> the UGA defense. And look, look, jokes aside, okay, so, so, you know, obviously Samson's been, he's been money all year. This is a big game. It's probably the, the okay, they played Alabama, but it's probably the toughest defense that they're going to play this year. Uh, Georgia, coming off a, 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 you know, probably the worst game that I can remember um, as a fan. You know, we've seen them lose to Alabama. That's kind of come customary, but basically against everybody else they beat. Ole Miss, uh, that game was just it was just ugly all around, really in all phases outside of that first drive. The defense uh, didn't have much answer for them. And I'm expecting a major bounce back here from the dogs. Uh, you know, really, you, you look sort of at the history of college football and athletics in general. When you have these sort of elite teams, uh, these proud programs, proud players, proud people who get humiliated, uh, generally you get their absolute best the very next time uh, they step on the field or the court, whatever, what have you. And I would expect that, that Georgia being a you know very proud team and basically getting dunked on uh, from last weekend, losing to Ole Miss, uh, sort of now they're really on the, on the edge here. This is a playoff game for Georgia. I guess for both of them, it sort of is, but certainly for Georgia, this is a playoff game. Win and you're in, probably. Uh, lose, you're almost assuredly out. So, you know, one of the, one of the things I saw last weekend was Ole Miss's intensity was just much higher. I mean, they they really showed up to that game, and, and UGA. I don't know what exactly they showed up to do. This weekend, though, there's really not going to be any mistake about it. I, I would assume. Uh, I think it's going to be a really really emotional game, really fired up defense, and with Tennessee, you know, Nico Iamaleva. There's a bit of a concern about is he fully healthy? Is he going to be full go for this game? Even still, though, I think with them, it's always been the same playbook. If you can stop the run, you will stop them. And I'll even just distill it all the way down for Georgia, and I, I believe this is probably their mindset as well. Is if they stop the run game, which is basically Dylan Sampson, they will win the game. I think that. Uh, I know that Georgia's offense is bad, and they're, they're liable to give a couple of short fields to Tennessee. Maybe, you know, maybe Sampson sneaks in a touchdown on, on a turnover or something like that. Um and I'm not saying he's going to have like a like zero points, right? Obviously, he might get his in some some moments, but you know, I, I just think Georgia's going to be really fired up this week. Uh, you know, in, in Tennessee, they have not fared well in Athens recently, so uh, we'll see what happens. But, but I'm I'm sitting Samson. Everything you say is logically sound on <laughs> some level. I am also a battered and beaten Georgia fan from this year. And I do not trust the squad <laughs> with anything right now. Um, I even I even put out a tweet where somebody was just talking about like like George uh, like Georgia was very um, like Georgia will be fired up like guaranteed for this weekend against Tennessee. I'm like, is that a guarantee? Because I didn't see it last week when we were getting our butts handed to us. So like, regardless, one thing I'll point out: you kind of mentioned Nico's status being undetermined for this game, and there are very conflicting reports out right now because Chris. Uh, Falica on on three just made a very blanket statement saying that Iamalieva will not be expected to play against Georgia. Meanwhile, Pete Thamel puts out a tweet m minutes later saying that uh, Iamalieva is in concussion protocol and that Heipel is saying that Iamalieva will, um, should be good to go for this weekend. Yeah, I'd but, expect he's going to play. <laughs> but like, it, regardless, like if... Iamalieva does not play. Does that change your opinion here at all? Not really, because, I mean, if, if he's coming in there not help, not 100% or not playing, I mean, it's not like Iamalieva's been, like, a, a world beater for them this year, right? I, I, I'm, <laughs> he's been he's been solid, but he's not been amazing, right? And, and particularly in, on the CFF side, it's not like, you know, anybody who's, who's been following his CFF production, it's not like he's been an incredible either, so... Um, with Tennessee again, you know it, it's, it is kind of the same thing every year. If you can stop them in the run game, you you will have a very good chance of shutting them down on offense. Um, my concern is more so about what is Georgia going to do on offense, <laughs> because if they just go three and out, three and out the way they were doing with Ole Miss, um, although Carson didn't really turn it over until the very end. But obviously, if you're giving short fields away, then yeah, Samson maybe sneaks in a couple of scores, and and then all of a sudden he's got a good day. So.
All right, let's move on to our wide receivers here, Justin. We'll throw yours out here. Again, a little a little bit of a cheeky one here, uh, given his injury status. But yeah. who do you got who, yeah. who you got <laughs> sitting at wide receiver? It's tough yeah, this, this week. This week was tough. At I was gonna say, I mean, uh, you say there's not that many buys, but I mean there are still buys piling up and, and you know you have to make a selection. So um definitely definitely reaching for low-hanging fruit this weekend or this week, I should say, but uh, Tez Johnson, Oregon wide receiver, uh, Jared mentioned it, you know, just sort of that question mark, is he going to play or not? Uh, that's kind of the reason <laughs> sort of has that health concern. I mean, if he was full go, uh, he, you know, there wouldn't really be much, much, much reason for me to want to sit him. Um, but just given that health concern, it's a pretty simple uh, explanation this week, just given the fact that we're not really sure what he's going to be this weekend. I generally don't like to play that game of trying to figure out, is he healthy? Is he not? I generally just exclude those players from consideration as, as painful as that might be, you know, Tess Johnson, obviously great player, but if he's not healthy and if he doesn't play, then you just get burned immediately. And and so I'd rather avoid that. Uh, you know, Tess Johnson, <laughs> that, that, that's, that's my pick. Well, and also again, this or this Oregon passing game hasn't been as prolific as it was in the previous years under Bo Nix, right? Even even with Tez Johnson getting some some of that volume, it just wasn't the same level as it was when his brother was literally the quarterback for the Ducks. Here, the other part of this is that Wisconsin, as a matchup, they're terrible against the run, but pretty solid against the pass. Twenty fourth in the country defending the pass in in terms of team performance here, so. I think that's another reason to kind of be wary of any Oregon player really this weekend. Again, we'll we'll, we'll talk about um, Dylan Gabriel here. We'll talk about uh, Treshawn Holden and some of the sit start questions here in a minute. But uh, no, I agree with you. Again, there's if if you've been relying on Tej Johnson, I'm sorry. There's just too many reasons not to just sit him this week. Try to find somebody else to kind of get you through this week. Uh, my my sit at wide receiver. Another matchup that I'm kind of concerned about is Syracuse going up against Cal this week. Cal, pretty solid defense, you know, top 50 versus the pass, top 40 versus the run, just very solid all the way around. We've seen them get into a ton of low scoring games or hold at, at the very least holding their opponents down and keeping them off the scoreboard very well. Syracuse, as we've seen all year, very hot and cold team. Kind of a tough matchup here. I don't trust that... You know, Kyle McCord is set to have multiple good, great games in a row here. Obviously, he had himself a pretty solid game against Virginia Tech last week. But even more so, I'm sitting Trebor Pena, a guy that, again, I, I, I hate to do this, but like, because I, I like Pena. I, I was high on him earlier this year, but as the season's just kind of gotten along, he has the volume, you know, nine, eight plus targets over the last three games. It's just not turning into tons of production, right? Again, you're looking at 10 yards a catch, 12 yards a catch, 8 yards a catch. Like, for the most part, like, yeah, he had 83 yards versus Virginia Tech, but, you know, hovering around 50 yards, hasn't scored a touchdown in three games. He's just not who Kyle McCord's looking for around the red zone anymore. He's got other options. It seems like he's liking better down there. You know, Jackson Meeks, who also hasn't scored a touchdown in three games. But, you know, um, I forget what the other wide receiver they have there. Miller, I think his, na- his name is. Obviously, Aronda Gatson's a beast in terms of a red zone target. So I'm just kind of following the trend here. Pena is not is clearly not one of the main priorities for Syracuse in terms of scoring anymore. So get to add that with a tough matchup, I'm sitting in this week. Yeah, I, I can get down with that. I mean, Syracuse has definitely been spreading the ball around more so than they did you know, right at the beginning of the season when Pena was sort of popping off. Now, you know, Meeks gets double-digit targets per game as well. And, you know, obviously Gaston's there. And then LaQuint Allen also gets work uh, in, in, in past cool. games. So a lot of mouths, a lot of mouths to feed in, on that one. Did you, did I just miss it? Or did you skip over your running back selection? I sure did. Well, I may, y'all, I am <laughs> off tonight. I know, uh, maybe I need to be better about adding my notes here. Yes, my running back selection <laughs> is Mr. Ahmad Hardy running back out of UNLV going up against Auburn. Not really much to say here, right? You got a you got a G5 running back going up against a Power 4 team here. Obviously, Hardy's been a beast the last 4 weeks. He got 100 plus yards in every single game. Uh almost a touchdown every single game, two touchdowns in two of his games. Like he is the clear workhorse back for Bryant Vincent. That's incredible. Problem is he's going up against Auburn who's not only just a bad matchup in terms of power four versus G5, but Auburn 
despite all their issues on offense and everything, that defense is still legit. They're top 15 in the country defending the run. There's no freaking way that a G5 team is about to expose that Auburn D-line there. They got talent. They got speed. Ahmad Hardy's great. He'll be great for years to come. He is not going to do it against the Tigers this weekend. So I don't think there's really much else to add there. It's just a bad matchup all around. Yeah, agreed. All right. Let's move on over to some of y'all's fan submitted start sick questions. Appreciate how many of these you guys have been sending. I know obviously a lot of you are, you know, worried about your playoff matchup. So you are coming to us, the quote unquote experts to get our opinions on this. Um, but you guys have been fantastic. If you want your questions answered, if you're listening to the show and you want to get your questions on the show, again, make sure you follow the at Chasing Daddy account. We put out a tweet every week. I've been pretty bad about putting them out pretty late recently. So that's why you should turn on notifications for that Chasing the Natty account. That way, one, you can see that tweet as soon as it comes out. But also, two, you can see every tweet that puts out when our shows come out so that you never miss a show. With all that being said, let's start with our first question here. This one comes to us from JT Gasson at Agvet06 on Twitter, a longtime listener of the show. I think it's probably the first time he's actually put one of his questions down below for this. So shout out to you, JT. He is asking us to pick between two quarter or to pick two quarterbacks between three quarterbacks in a get this, Justin, six mm-hmm. point passing touchdown league. And a nine-point rushing touchdown <laughs> league. I yeah, can I, I can I can hear <laughs> Eric Froton right now, like hearing the six-point passing touchdowns, being like, "Yes, yes, yes," and then hearing nine-point <laughs> rushing touchdowns, being like, "No, no, no." Um, regardless, our Certainly, three. Ob- it's a unique unique setup. I mean, I've never heard of that before. I, it, it's wild. People love their touchdown points in this league, apparently. Regardless, <laughs> regardless, um, our three quarterback options, I should probably get to that at some point here. Uh, Dylan Gabriel at Wisconsin. We just discussed that matchup a second ago. Uh, Owen McCallan, uh, quarterback of the UTSA, going up against North Texas. And then we also got Jake Retzleff, the quarterback out of BYU, going up against Kansas this week. So let me kind of run through this real quick. We are picking two, and I think... I'm going to boil this down to, I think I'm just going to go with the two guys with the better matchups here, right? All three of these guys have been pretty productive throughout the year. So the kind of the tiebreaker here is the fact that one, Oh McCown is going against North Texas defense, which gives up points to everybody. Their passing defense is bottom five in the country. Oh McCown has been fantastic the last couple of weeks, you know, 30 plus points in his, each of his last two games, 300 plus yards in two of his last three games, four plus touchdowns in two of his last three games. He's getting points one way or another. My only worry is that this just happens to be the game. Kind of like a a Jalen Raynor game from last year when, you know, it's possible UTSA puts up 70 points this weekend, but unfortunately you just have bad luck and all the running backs score the touchdowns or some crap like that. In which case, if that's how you're deciding whether or not you're, which quarterbacks are starting or not, that's not the way to go. That's just, you gotta, you gotta take those lumps if that happens. Oh, McCallum should be in for a fantastic weekend this weekend. And my projections show that they got him projected at 27.6 points. I wouldn't be shocked if he got higher than that. The other quarterback that I'll be going with here is Jake Retzlaff. Kansas is bottom 25 in the country versus the pass. They're also bottom, uh, doing the math in my head real quick, bottom 40 in the country versus the run as well. So Retzlaff will be able to use his feet a little bit. Obviously, if you have LJ Martin, you're liking that matchup as well there. BYU should be able to put up some serious points in this game. And then you that leaves Dylan Gabriel, who I just discussed that matchup versus Wisconsin. It's kind of sneaky tough. Wisconsin's secondary is pretty solid. Obviously, Oregon's probably the more talented team. They're probably going to be able to overcome that secondary for the most part. But if you're asking me who provides the most risk of these three, it's got to be Gabriel. So I'm going to go with McCowan. I'm going to go with Retzleff. Justin, while I'm putting our tokens up here, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, I mean, you basically stole the words right out of my mouth. I mean, I, I think going with the two of the with the better matchup is sort of, I think, sound logic here. And and you're not giving up too much in terms of, you know, the profiles of each. I mean, McCown and, and Restlap have been pretty productive in their own right this year. They've been pretty good in CFF as well. So, you know, I, I don't know that for, for me, it's it's not quite as uh it's not, not too difficult of, of a decision. And that maybe that's a boring answer, agreeing here with Jared. But, uh, you know, I think these two matchups, as you sort of pointed out, uh, too good to pass up. 
No, oh, yeah, right. Again, like that, 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 the UTSA North Texas game just on paper seems like the CFF matchup of the year. The only problem is that whenever I say that, you pretty much end with a game that's like, you know, 23 to 20. And we all just sit there wondering why Vegas had the line so high. Um, we all know why, because both of these defenses are absolutely terrible. But regardless, uh, in terms of projections, I kind of alluded to my projections earlier. They agree with both Justin and I. Um, I got O. McCallan at 27.6 fantasy points. We got Jake Retzleff at 24.8. In terms of the CUC projections, they actually have Retzleff and Gabriel as the highest ones at 23 and 22, respectively. Although I do think it's undercounting McCallan just a little bit because of some of his earlier season uh, disappointing games. But regardless of anything else, I'm, I, again, I'm glad my projections agree with us. So next question up here. Let's throw it up here. A question from another longtime listener of the show, Brett Ponyi. Shout out Brett uh, at Brett Muck Dogs on Twitter. Uh, Brett, I hope the Muck Dogs are doing well this year. Regardless of anything else, he has a three-way running back question here for us. We got Mika Bernard, the running back out of Utah, going up against Colorado this weekend. We have Desmond Reed, running back out of Pittsburgh, going up against Clemson. Or we can go with my man, Dylan Carson, running back out of Air Force, going up against Oregon State this weekend. Uh, Justin, this is this is quite the quite the question, in my opinion, here. Because, again, you got, you know, Reed, who's been fantastic, but I'd say of these three, probably has the toughest matchup. Or you can go with Dylan Carson, who could make or break your weekend this this weekend. So which way are you going on this one? We got to pick one. Yeah, and, and I agree. This is an interesting question. There's a lot of different different elements at play. I, I would say in terms of these three players, different uh, different appeal to each. Uh, Carson, sort of an interesting name there, had had sort of his breakout game of the year uh, last weekend after sort of disappointing most of his drafters for, throughout the the duration duration of the season. Um, and then you know Bernard over there at Utah. Utah's kind of been a their offense has sort of just been down overall. Uh, you know, quarterbacks getting injured obviously doesn't help. Uh, and they're playing Colorado this weekend, which, you know, matchup wise, it's, it's not, to me, it's sort of just I don't know, middle of the road. There, there's nothing really that stands out. It's not terrible. It's not great. Uh, and then Desmond Reed has clearly been the best player of these three through, you know, the, the duration of the season. Uh, but his matchup, I guess, is, is sort of, yeah, sort of the worst. I mean, they're certainly playing the, the toughest opponent of the three. Uh, we're starting one, and I, I think I'm still going to go with old reliable here in Desmond Reed. And, and the reason is that his usage, the way they use him, is kind of makes him matchup proof because he he gets a lot of receiving usage as well. So even if this is a game where, as it turns out, you know Pittsburgh's getting, you know they're they're sort of from behind, playing from behind most of the game, I still trust that Reed's going to get you know some targets and could probably still find the end zone. Uh, it might be via the air in that case, but you know he's generally been pretty pretty good, and and a reason you know in CFF, and the reason for that is again he gets the rushing usage and the receiving volume, so it's sort of regardless of how the game script plays out, you can sort of trust him, you know, and it, it's it's hard to sort of take a chance. I'd have a hard time taking a chance on these other two players being Bernard and Dylan Carson over a proven commodity like Desmond Reed. Uh, even with this matchup, which again, you know, I mean, Clemson's a, they're, they're a tougher team certainly than, than Oregon state and Colorado, but you know, I, I don't know that like, I trust that they're just going to shut Desmond Reed down. I mean, they, yeah, they're better than Pitt, uh, but I don't know. I, I, I still trust that, uh, Desmond Reed to have a, a pretty good day. Does Eli Holstein's kind of recent slide, both health wise and also just performance when he is out there concern you at all when it comes to Reed? Sure, of course. I mean, you know, ideally Pitt's offense is at full capacity and, and they're playing well. That would be ideal. But, you know, if, even with Holstein, like if he's not seeing the field as well, that could actually be a benefit if he's checking it down. I mean, there, there's different ways you can kind of look at it. I, I don't want to get too in the weeds there. But ultimately, yeah, that is a consideration, but it's not enough for me to to decide to take a chance. I mean, it, 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 there's interesting plays here, certainly, you know, for, for style points. You know, you look amazing if you if you start Dylan Carson this week. That would be a great 
uh, you know, that'd be a great victory over your opponent, I'm sure, with, with a Dylan Carson monster performance. But I don't know that if, you know, if I'm choosing this week, if I'm going to choose him versus Desmond Reed, it'd be hard. It'd be a hard pill to swallow for me. So the way I'm thinking about this one, I agree. Michael Bernard's kind of the one out of these three that's not really doing much for any me, for, not really doing much for me in any way. He's been solid, not great. You know, 15 points he gets you the last two weeks, which is kind of impressive given the fact that Utah's offense is just, you know, falling apart more and more as the season goes yeah. along. They just lost Brandon Rose. They just lost Brant Keithy as well. Like they're they're losing guys left and right over there. Maybe that's good for Bernard. He's the only guy they can rely on. But regardless, you got Colorado this weekend. They're Colorado again, pretty solid versus the run. You know, top forty in the country. So not doing much for me there. Here's the question I'll ask you, Brett. When you look at your matchup this week, and I don't know if this is a playoff matchup or if this is like a play-in matchup, you know, for playoffs or anything like that. But let's just let's just say that this is like a do-or-die game, right? When you look at your opponent across from you. And you kind of create a spread for yourself a little bit. Are you? Do you consider yourself the favorite and or just very competitive? In that case, I go with Reed. I think you just play it safe. Even if Reed, with you know the issues on Pitt's offense right now, the tough matchup versus Clemson, I think he's a very solid 15 points at least this weekend, right? At, at like worst case scenario, right? Because even the worst case scenario really was what Pitt did versus Syracuse, where they had three defensive touchdowns. They didn't need Reed to do anything in that game, right? Yeah. Regardless, if they're competitive in the game, or if they're actually fighting for the game, Reed's going to get involved. So I think he's the safest play. But if you look across and you look at that opponent, you're sitting there thinking like, uh, he's probably got me by a good 20 points here. What do you got to lose? Play Carson. Play that matchup against Oregon State, bottom five team against the run. They're atrocious, right? Air, like, roll the dice that Air Force has finally gotten things figured out on that offense, on that, again, in this incredible matchup here towards the end. Again, only do that if you're going to be, if you really feel like that you're kind of in the hole here, right? And you got nothing else to lose. If, if Carson plays and, you, and he's a bust, like, oh, well, I was probably going to lose the game anyway, Right. So at risk of taking my points on this show, I'll start Carson here just as the fun one. And just so we have a disagreement here. <laughs> um, but also like regardless, I would say if you want to play it safe and you feel like you're competitive already, go with, go with Reed. If you need a hail Mary, you got to go with Carson. So, all right, put our tokens back here. Let's move on to our third question here. As soon as I find the button, there we go. This one comes to us from another longtime listener of the show. I really wanted to shout out some of these guys this week, but 863Kane at FLA Eagle 777 on Twitter. He's asking us to pick two wide receivers in a half PPR format between Denzel Boston, wide receiver to Washington, going up against UCLA this weekend, or we can go with Jackson Meeks, the wide receiver to Syracuse, going up against Cal, or we can go with Pat Bryant, the wide receiver out of Illinois, going up against Michigan State. So, Justin, I will ask you, all three of these wide receivers have something in common. What is, what is that? All three have something in common. Hmm. I mean, this is quite open-ended. I mean, are we talking about their production having something in common? or? Uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we say that. Uh, they've all been scoreless in the last three games or something like that? They have been all. They, all three of these guys are top targets on their team, and they've been held scoreless the last three games. Wow. This is just a matter of who, uh, to me, I think all three are pretty solid plays. Again, I, I, I talked crap about Pena earlier. I still don't love the matchup against Cal, but I think Meeks's you know, volume speaks for itself here. You know, nine targets, nine targets, 11 targets. He'll be involved. He is a guy that before the last three weeks, McCord was absolutely targeting in the red zone a ton. Obviously, we hope that changes here against Cal. Denzel Boston was a guy that I was highlighting as a touchdown regression candidate earlier in the season, right? Because he was just scoring so many dadgum touchdowns. Well, the touchdown regression has come. Zero touchdowns held over the last three weeks. But, 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 got a nice matchup here against UCLA. I think he's able to score again this weekend. Clearly the top guy in this offense. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start Boston. And that just leaves me between Jackson Meeks and Pat Bryant. And you know what? The Pat Bryant hate ends today. 
Justin. Pat Bryant hate ends today. I will be starting him. Because again, when you, <laughs> when, when, when you look at Michigan State's uh, passing defense, they're 100th in the country versus Cal's 48th. I'm just going to play the matchup here. One thing I am a little bit concerned about with Boston, though, I forgot to mention this, is the fact that again, there's a little bit of rain expected coming in for this game. So that might play into things a little bit, but regardless, I'm going to pray that that gets out of here by Friday and we have ourselves a nice normal game here. Give me Boston. Give me Pat Bryant. I'll sit Jackson Meeks because, again, I'm just a little bit more concerned about that matchup than the other two guys. What about you, Justin? Yeah, well, I mean, it's another good question. And, and really, I feel like I deserve a round of applause for, for guessing that uh, that trivia earlier on. Because I really, yeah, I didn't even know that. That just sort of seemed like something that might have been the case. Because I know each of these guys haven't scored recently. Um, proud of you that you've overcome the the, the, the Pat Bryan hate. Uh, it's a big day. Um, it is a big and, day. You know, I think all three of these guys are definitely candidates this week to for a bounce back you know certainly the score this week I, I think this feels like a week where each of them have pretty good matchups certainly uh bryant bryant and, and boston have good matchups and so you know it just feels like the, the touchdowns are going to have to come back at some point you know it's the part of part of the regression has been you know some tougher opponents in there as well you know yeah, playing penn state for washington that that's that's a tough defense um yeah, I mean, I I can get down with, with the, both of those as well. It, for me, this is not. Um, I don't. I don't know if I have super clear preference. It's more just like okay, well, the matchups for for Bryant and Boston uh, definitely are better, uh, and that maybe is just a tiebreaker. But you know, Meeks is kind of uh, in terms of raw targets. You know, he actually sees more targets than you know of the top three, as you mentioned, Jared, and, and that. Typically, that's kind of, I mean, that that would be sort of uh, something that I'd want to weigh a little bit heavier. Um, but, you know, the matchup maybe is a little bit more overshadowing for, for me in this. And this is a, a half PPR format, if yes. I re remember correctly. There's not a full PPR format. So, it, you know, it, at least, so it, on one hand, yeah, half is good for for those guys who are getting high targets. Because, I mean, you can, you can get a lot of receptions and yardage and still get a good day. But certainly, you know, in half PPR touchdowns, the guys who are scoring touchdowns are, are still the priority. And, yeah, Boston and Bryant feel just like Meeks. But, uh, you know, Boston and Bryant feel uh, due for, for a touchdown now. We're three weeks or three games straight for both these guys who are scoring two touchdowns a game in September. So, yeah, I, again, I was unfortunate. You know, this may be boring for, for, for the neutral listeners, but good for the guys who are asking. We're going to agree on this one again. Yeah, I agree with you. They very much feel like, for, for two guys that were, basically almost their entire role was scoring touchdowns earlier this season, for them to go this yeah. long without it, they're absolutely due for one. And you, get, and you give me good matchups that they can take advantage of? Yeah, I'll go with that. Um, in terms of our projections, forgot to answer this in the last question but uh, my projections have agreed with us they have boston and bryant as the top two they have boston at 20 points this weekend they have pat bryant at 16 the c to c projections have actually meeks and bryant as the two top high um, projected here so if you want to follow our ranking or follow our projections there um kane you can do that or you can listen to justin and i so Next question here comes to us from Far Away Tots at F Tots 86984 on Twitter. Half PPR format for or power four only league here. He's asking to pick between a guy that I mentioned earlier, Demir Miller, wide receiver out of Rutgers, who I will go ahead and tell you I am starting here because I don't want to be a hypocrite. Or we can go with Treshawn Holden, wide receiver out of Oregon here. Justin, I'll throw this way. I'll throw this one to you first. What are you doing here, man? Hmm. Well, you know, unlike you, I guess I'm not pitching hell into starting Miller given our previous answers. And and when you when we talked about Miller, for, so for the person who asked this question, if you if you didn't watch the whole show, I, I'd recommend making sure you, you go back and, and check that segment out. Cause I spoke about Miller um again as somebody who had him rostered last week in, in one of my leagues. I watched that game against Minnesota and Look, maybe I'm putting too much stock into or reading too much into that second half and, and sort of just what happened there. Maybe it's just a case of either they're going to sort of just chalk that up to a bad half. But to me, it seemed like he sort of lost confidence from his quarterback and his OC. Now, 
how, how does that manifest itself in the next week? Could be nothing, could be something. It's hard to say. I mean, am I even correct in my you know conspiracy theory here? Who knows, right? But um, for me, I mean, it's a bit bit of a tough question. Uh, again, as I said in the earlier segment, would love for Dimir Miller to have a great game this week. That would be great for for, for my squads as well. Um, and then you know, if Oregon. And this is another game we spoke about. Uh, Wisconsin's pass defense is actually pretty good. Um, you know, Trayshawn Holden, obviously. So with Des Des Johnson, who, who we were talking about earlier, if, you know, if he's not fully full go or if he's not playing, Trayshawn Holden could be a guy who benefits from that, right? Uh, but Evan Stewart's still there. Jordan James is still there. I mean, there's still all these other guys who are, who are gonna who are gonna command touches as well. So it's not. It's not super cut and dry for me. I mean, I, I could kind of go waffle back and forth on each of these. You know, Dimir, his volume's been so good the last couple of weeks. And, and okay, it was really bad second half. Really hated his body language. And, and I hope that's not something that translates into the next week. Uh, I'm going to take a chance here and I'm, I'm going to roll with Dimir because he seems to have emerged as their top guy. I hope they didn't lose confidence in him last weekend. You know, it was one bad half, but. We'll see this weekend for sure. Uh, again, I know Kyle, well, I don't know, but it seems likely Kyle Manonga is coming back. So how does that affect things? We'll see. I mean, uh, he was he was in he was in the game during uh, Miller's 20 target performance, right? Or at least for most of that game. So yeah. we know that both can, can both eat at the same time. So uh, I'm going to roll with Miller. I'm not super, super confident in Miller, but I had to pick between the two. I think that's who I'm going with. I think it's fair to be slightly... You know, concern about Miller, given you know what you're describing there in the second half. Yeah, I'm, I'm far less confident in Treshawn Holden. Um, yeah, I can't mention like the the theory of the case here, right? Is that Treshawn Holden is you know set to benefit greatly from Tej Johnson potentially being out? But guess what? We didn't see that last week. Yeah, two targets, two catches, thirty yards. Tej Johnson did not play in that game, and so you would think if if, if Holden is going to be the direct beneficiary here, that we would have seen it. Um, we we did see a nice performance against Michigan. Obviously, seven cat or seven targets, six catches, 149 yards. Big problem here is no touchdowns for Holden. But also, like I said, like Oregon's offense hasn't really been as you know, air or not air raid. They've never they've never been air raid, but they're not they're not giving Gabriel a crap ton of touchdowns through the air or anything like that. Um, again, Holden just volume wise far less than Miller. I like the matchup better against Maryland for Miller. I just I, I personally don't see a way that I could justify starting Holden over Miller at this point. So Alright, let's move on to our last question here. This one comes to us from our boy at Realist Chris K, who bullied me into allowing this question onto the show. Uh he's asking us to pick between three players here for a flex spot. We got uh Nicholas uh Senecal, the wide receiver out of Hawaii, a kind of recent, um, I say a recent um, breakout player for the Rainbow Warriors over there. Or we can go with Jaden Thomas, the running back out of UNLV, or who's going up against, who are they going up against this weekend? They are going up against, oh, it's right here on the graphics, uh, San Diego State this weekend. Or we can go with Nate Noel, the running back out of Mizzou, going up against South Carolina. Chris, before I throw this over to Justin, let me just say, if these are your three options, I have a great therapist number that you can call uh, in order for you to get over this decision that you have to make here. So, Justin, throwing it over to you, man. What do you think? Yeah, well, I was going to say, I mean, looking at these options, I, I don't know, is he just doing this to torture us? I mean, I, look, I, <laughs> there's only, I'm not a magician here. I mean, there's only so much I can do. You know, I, I don't know. I don't like any of these options. Obviously, this is a deep league. And, and so the threshold probably of what you're looking for in terms of a successful day, maybe is a little different than the standard league. That, that's what I'm assuming based on these options. Um, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> the Utah State-Hawaii game, uh, definitely is, feels like a classic Mountain West game that could could turn into a lot of points. Sinackle, who you mentioned, has kind of been a guy who was, you know, he had 16 targets a couple weeks ago. Pulled back uh, a little bit this past weekend with only five targets versus UNLV, but uh, I believe UNLV is, is strong versus the pass, but not against the run. Or am I mixing that up? Am I correct on that? Or I don't mean to put uh, you on the spot. No, you, if, know you know... UNLV, I can I, I can look that up for you right now. Let me. Sure. 
I that would, that would help got it here. UNLV is yeah strong versus the pass, weaker versus the rush. Okay, so so they're not disastrous know, that, that... on either front though. <laughs> okay, well that that muddy is the. I'm trying to create a story here in terms of Sinacle where yeah he emerges two weeks ago, then he plays a team with a strong pass defense, so they have to run the ball more. That's why he only has five targets. But now this weekend he's going to get double digit targets. But now it just kind of feels like I'm grasping at straws here. You know, no, no, you got you got uh, that right again. UNLV they got they're they're forty second versus the pass, and then seventy first versus the run. So there is a weakness in the right. run. Right, but yeah, as you mentioned, it's not quite as as dramatic as as maybe I was thinking initially. But, but nonetheless, do, do, do you yeah. do you want me to really throw you off? Fresno, oh, yeah, sure, sure. Fresno State's passing defense fifteenth in the country. That's the game he went for 16 targets on. Yeah, well, so yeah, of, that doesn't of, make of, much sense. Of course, right? Of course. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So the story, the story maybe is, is broken down. But uh, when you're choosing amongst these sort of options, I think these are the kind of fantasies you kind of have to tell yourself in you know in the, in the before game and when you're selecting your starters. So how many are we choosing here? Is it one or two? Just one, thank God. Oh, thank God. Yeah, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah, I mean, uh, and then Jaden Thomas. Um, they're playing against who are they playing against? Uh, Jaden Thomas is going up against um, San, oh, Diego, San State. Diego State. Literally against right on just the graphic. right there on yeah. the graphic. How do we both do this? <laughs> I don't know. It's getting late um, where I am. I guess same for you. Um, okay, and then Nate Noel is playing South Carolina. So South Carolina, I do know, has a pretty strong defensive front. Um, that's probably you know not a, again, I, but again, comparing to these other two, I, I suppose you could talk yourself into it. Um, you know what? I'm gonna roll with Snackle, just because there's there's some elements there that I like. I mean, again, 16 targets a couple of weeks ago. This is a Mountain West conference. I mean, I guess the the running back one with Thomas is also a Mountain West conference uh, showdown as well. But I don't know. Th- this Utah State versus Hawaii game feels like it could, it could get wild. You know, sort of a classic Mountain West conference uh, shootout. Hopefully, uh, for Chris's sake, uh, that's probably what you're hoping for there. And so I don't know. I'm gonna roll with Snackle. Um, I, just these two running backs, I I, I can't stomach uh, starting them. There's not enough really for me to, to to hold on to. I can't stomach doing Nate Noel as much as I want to believe in Mizzou's offense kind of getting on track here. It's it's shot without Brady without Brady Cook back there. They have no chance. Um, it's South Carolina's defense again. One of one of the best units in the country. 14th versus the rush. Fourth against the pass. Mizzou's not doing anything versus South Carolina this weekend. So he's a definite sit for me. It comes down between Jaden Thomas and Sinako here, right? Because both of these have really good matchups. Like, Jaden Thomas going up against San Diego State here. They're 119th in the country in team performance versus the run. So, and they're honestly getting worse by the week. Yeah, Thomas does not have the volume that you really wish you could see out of him. But, you know, he can get upwards of 14 to 16 carries. And I think that's more than enough to do damage against San Diego State there. And then, like you said, Sanako, like, again, going up against Utah State, right? They're 121st versus the pass. They're 133rd versus the run, right? Like, that's Hawaii should be able to actually have a really good offensive performance here. Here's the thing I'm really worried about. They play at Utah State. And this game is supposed to get into the mid-30s. And there's a possibility, it says 25% chance of rain right now, but there's a possibility of snow in this game. How do you think, you know, Hawaii players are going to fare in those elements? Well, in my defense, I had no idea. But look, no, I, no, 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 this is not against you, but I'm, I'm just putting this out there for people of like, I, this is honestly a reason like I might even consider like sitting Ashlock in a couple of leagues this week because like, I'm not sure that that really does well for, you know, Hawaii players this week. That's just not elements that they are used to playing in. So I think because of that, I'm going to lean towards actually Jaden Thomas here. Again, you got a nice nice matchup here. I don't love going with running backs by committee here, but it's either go with running back by committee in a good matchup or I go with receiver by committee in a good matchup, but that also has some weather issues. So I'll go with Thomas here. And did did that change your mind at all, Justin? Or well, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm not going to request 
you know, that you switch up my answer, but yeah, should, certainly I think, cause this one, you know, I don't, it's just all the options are bad. So like the weather thing seems like the biggest Trump card, like that'd be the biggest thing that I'd probably <laughs> weigh in the decision, but look, it is what it is. I mean, uh, who knows? We'll, we'll see what happens. By the way, shout out Nate Marquise for finding that little tidbit. I would not have, I would not have thought to look at that without him mentioning it in our Slack. So I got I got to give him props here. Shout out Nate. As always, speaking of shouting out Nate, we're here at the end of our show, and this is a perfect time for us to hype up our next Defending the Natty episode, where you, Justin, will be joining Nate and I, and we're going to do some Dynasty hot takes. It'll be a fun time. Um, yeah. yeah or do, do you want to tease anybody with, you have, you have any Di Dynasty hot takes uh, ready to go here that you can tease people with? No, they'll have to tune in uh, to get the to get these hot takes. I mean, they they know what I bring to the table, you know, and and I know the fans have been clamoring to get somebody who who really knows what they're talking about, not not a third rate analyst on that show. So it's really, it's a travesty, sort of a waste, you know, with with, with CFF Nate on there. So, uh, I'm I'm here to bring light into the darkness, and I'm I'm fired up about it. Nah, it's gonna be an absolute good time, Nate. I do not agree with anything that Justin says, whether it's joking oh, or not. Jared, Jared gave me the script beforehand. I'm just no, 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 no. That's this is a lie. These are lies. These are lies. Um, regardless, make sure you check that show out. It's gonna be an absolute blast. Um, if you're still in your leagues after this week, which if you're listening to the show, you absolutely will be. Make sure you tune in next week. We still got the waiver wire show. We still got the sit start show for next week, and we are continuing with that all the way until the end of the se until the end of the regular season. It's gonna be an absolute blast. With all that being said, Justin, appreciate you joining me, man. And for everybody else out there listening, appreciate you guys listening. And I hope you guys have a wonderful and fantastic Week 12. Good luck in your playoff matchups.